know, we really want to be respectful of everyone's time, especially our very gracious presenters who have agreed to um, lead today's session with um, all the really important um, facts and tips and um, experiences that they want to share with us in our boot camp, research and writing boot camp. Um, we are so grateful that you have um, so graciously agreed to do this a second time for us. Um, the boot camp uh, today is our final uh, touch point in terms of our um, learn lunch and learn um, sessions that we've been having. This is our third and final for the um, boot camp, and we have some very distinguished uh, presenters who are going to be sharing with us today: Dr. De Carlo, Dr. Salentic Dowell. Dr. Willingham and Dr. Saul, um, who are all experts in their own right. And, you know, the bios have been shared previously, so we don't have to spend a lot of time on that. Um, but I do want to say that we're especially grateful for your um, advice that you're going to share with us. And we want to congratulate you on the book that um, we expect that we'll be learning a little bit more about in the session today as we did um, last year. I found it to be particularly useful and helpful to me as a scholar. And um, I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Salentic Dowell to take kind of take charge of the rest of the session. Um, I will keep notes um, in the, or keep note of what's coming up in the chat. And if there are any questions I need to highlight for you all, I will um, willingly do that. Um, but please take it away. Um, expect a, a little bit of an introduction separate from what was already shared with the, the group. Um, but, you know, thank you so much again for, for doing this for us. Well, we are absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, it's quite an honor uh, for all of us. And um, I'm actually going to let Dr. Willingham um, steer this ship. Um, she's our appointed leader at this point. Um, and I, I want everyone to know that, um, yes, we are presenting um, on a book that we wrote during COVID because the four of us couldn't quite sit still and didn't know what to do with ourselves. Um, and it was born out of uh, the work that we were doing with doctoral students and what we felt was a lack of a codified sort of experience. Um, so you see all of our names up there. Um, you see that I work at Louisiana State University and I am lucky enough to work with Dr. Robinson. And I share that with um, Dr. DiCarlo, who is also uh, from Louisiana State University and Leah Catherine Saul, who is an LSU grad, um, who took a lot of coursework in both the School of Ed and the School of Leadership and Human Resource Development. And Dr. Saul is now at Loyola in Maryland and um, Dr. Willingham, who just assumed a new position at Eastern Mennonite University. So Dr. Willingham, take it away. Good afternoon, late morning to everyone. Um, and so I'll want to encourage you as you participate today is to really engage and use the chat. There'll be several opportunities, but we'll ask you to put it in the chat and you'll notice that um, any one of us will respond to you in the chat. So please feel free to, to use that feature and that function. Um, in addition, we will leave time at the end of our session today for some Q&A as well. And so, as you know, uh, writing is a process and it's a product. And so we are going to kick off with our first quick write um, by Leah. Oops, sorry. One back, I think. Um, hi, everyone. Excited to get started and start learning what your focus is. Um, so we're throughout this session, we're going to have a series of quick writes uh, to kind of get you get the juices flowing, get your uh, neurons and synapses connecting, and also give you a taste of the kinds of activities that are inside of the book. Um, that hopefully serve as a mentor from the page. So our first one here is what are you becoming an expert in? And so uh, we kind of have a mad gabs for you on the screen and it says, I am becoming an expert or am an expert in whatever your component of your discipline is. Uh, we want you to tell us a little bit about what your research agenda, agenda is, what the topic that you're focused on is, and what 
uh, theories and methodologies ground your research agenda. And then finally, that uh, final point is that your research agenda attempts to address a certain number of strands or components or questions and then have a list. So if I were to model this, I would say I am an expert in adult literacy and adult education. And my research agenda specifically is risk literacies, which are grounded in both critical theories, um, especially uh, disciplinary studies, and um, I am a mixed methodologist or using mixed methodologies, qual, quan, both. Uh, my research agenda attempts to address a number of strands and questions, specifically um, training educators to become literacy leaders in the field, as well as questions around risk literacies with adolescents and adults. So that is my who I am um, and who I hope to be. And we ask if you can do the same thing in the chat. So we'll give you, Ty, what do we have? Maybe a minute or two? All right. This information is also going to help us hopefully to tailor this workshop to your needs and also learn a lot more about um, where you are in your trajectory as a scholar and as a writer. Margaret, Mary, do you want to also share yours as another exemplar? Sure. And I don't want anyone who's participating with us today to worry too much about complete sentences. Um, we're just trying to get a sense of, of where you're at. So I like to think that I am still becoming an expert at um, literacy in urban environments. Um, and my research agenda is focused on literacy leadership. Um, it's grounded in theories of uh, a number of theories, um, but I look to the work um, of those who have codified and identified what urban education is. And I primarily used use case study and um, either auto ethnographic or ethnographic methodologies. And I have three strands to my research and I'm really, really concerned about how we prepare um, PK-12 leaders and teachers to work in urban environments. Thanks, Amim. And I can see Regina in the chat mentioned that she is becoming an expert in African-American women in senior level leadership positions, uh, like one of our dear friends here, Ty. <laughs> um, and what about you, Cindy? What would you say you're becoming an expert or are an expert in? Um, I'm an expert in social and emotional development of young children, and I'm becoming an expert in workforce development for the field of early childhood. That is out of necessity on the current situations that we are experience, experiencing in the field, particularly in the world of child care, which is traditionally very low paying. So I'm just dipping my toe in, in that pool right now. So my research agenda has largely been focused on innovations to recommended practices um, in early childhood education, as well as interventions to increase outcomes for young children, um, and uh, mainly grounded in behaviorist theory and using single case research methodologies. So my agenda is attempting to address, um, I, I would say now, it traditionally has been two major strands, which has been the innovations and in recommended practice and then interventions, but now expanding to looking at um, uh, retention in, um, in the early childhood workforce. 
Awesome. Thanks, Cindy. And in the chat, I can see it, things are starting to come in. Very exciting. So Charlotte is becoming an expert in first-generation Black male student athletes and graduation rates. I'm, I'm guessing retention rates is probably part of that as well, which is very interesting. And Sabrina is becoming an expert in higher education leadership. Her research agenda is Black women in higher education senior leadership and their journey to getting to that role. Um, using Black feminist thought and sister circles as her methodology. Very interesting. Um, and Audrey is becoming an expert in PBL, and her research agenda is based on culturally responsive teaching. Um, Shantae is becoming an expert in race and ethnicity and social stratification, uh, research agenda addressing anti-Blackness in higher education grounded in CRT using qualitative methodologies like interviewing content and textual analysis and three strands of research, the experiences of Black higher ed professionals who engage in DEI, the role of Black faculty in community colleges, and the impact of the former on Black students. Awesome. Um, so definitely keep them coming in. It's it's wonderful to see uh, your foci. Um, I see most recently um, expertise in health organizational culture in, related to maternity care. Very big topic right now. Very interesting. Um, so across different sectors, uh, education, health, and I'm sure others. And we look forward to learning more about you as we keep going. And I'm really interested in Dr. Michelle Meggs, who's becoming an expert in ratchet womanism and how Black women and girls use ratchetness as a tool of resistance. So we are all in good company. Awesome. Well, MM, I'm turning it over to you to help frame um, why we engaged in this work and really took on the task of not just writing a book, but writing a book with a purpose to, to shape, to develop, to inform um, our, our novice scholars and those that are potentially new to the publishing, particularly publishing in academic spheres. So I like to uh, identify, identify myself as a transplanted Southerner. I am not Southern by birth, but I assure people sometimes when they say, where are you from? And I say, not here, that I got here as soon as I could, which was <laughs> about 25 years ago. Um, so on my journey, uh, my PhD journey, I was one of those non-traditional students. Um, I was older than most of the people that were in my cohort. Uh, and I earned my terminal degree at the University of Iowa. And I also had children in middle school. Um, so when things would happen during the day, I had to work full time. And then I would commute um, from a little town in Northeast Iowa called Waterloo, Iowa. I think some of you might know where that is now. Um, and so I always felt a little bit of dissonance and I felt left out sometimes because they weren't um, programming for non-traditional students. And that's how I saw myself. Um, I'm also first generation, uh, the only person in my family to date who has earned a PhD. Um, I have a grandfather who went as far as fifth grade. I had a mother who dropped out of school at 16 and my father um, actually did earn his BA, um, but it was most mostly happenstance and fortuity. So I was concerned um, when I came to LSU um, on the support systems for doctoral students. Um, oh, yes, Miss Patrice Bounds. We are Hawkeyes forever. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Um, I was concerned. And um, what I did is I created a class, a writing seminar, um, but it was a heavy lift because I felt like I was the only one doing it. And I have lots of support from colleagues who would come in and they would they would do like a guest lecture and a guest demonstration. Um, but I was concerned that there wasn't enough diversity in what we were, what I was trying to do and what we were sharing. Um, and I knew um, also as a writing person, as a former high school English teacher and the director of the LSU Writing Project, that writing is, as we mentioned in the very beginning, it's a process, it's a skill set. You are not born a writer. Um, I think some of us may be uh, 
we, we are trained to be really, really good communicators and we speak very well. Um, but there is this sense of writing is a little bit different and that's true. So it is both a process and a product and it's constantly, constantly recursive. You might have an idea, you might put it down on paper or on your computer screen and you go back to it and you refine it over and over. And so the four of us, um, we got together during COVID and um, we said, hey, how can we do this? <laughs> Thank you, Kayla. Um, how can we do this? Um, and we decided that we would basically take all of our own experiences, what worked for us to maintain productivity, and it's very different, and we would try to put it on the page. Um, we pitched our idea to a first um, uh, publishing house, and they said no. Um, and then we repitched it to stage, uh, Sage, and they said yes. And we also have a goal of trying to demystify the academic writing and publishing process. Um, it is not something that we think enough time is spent on. We hear things all the time in, in, in classes like form a writing group, but nobody really gives the concrete steps of what works for a writing group. Um, so that's basically how we came to do this. And we went round and round and round. Everything that we wrote, all four of us touched. We had different responsibilities for chapters. Um, but then we really worked hard to make sure that we had a clear sort of voice, but that we were also representing many voices. So polyvocality was something that we were striving for. Thank you, Margaret Mary. And so I, that'll take us to our next uh, quick right in the chat. And so I just want to bridge a little bit in terms of looking at who's on um, the call today and particularly why this text and especially what Margaret Mary was talking about is so important is because for all of us, we bring our identity to this work. Um, and so if, I, if Margaret Mary is telling her story, she's bringing her identity as a non-traditional doctoral student, as a working parent, as a single parent. Um, for myself, um, I bring my identity also as a first generation uh, PhD completer. Uh, and I also bring my identity as a Black woman. Um, and oftentimes, particularly for many of us, when we are thinking about our research topics and what pulls us to ask deep questions um, or who we want to interview if we're doing qualitative research or the type of data that we're pulling from large databases, oftentimes it's a reflection of who we are um, at a piece of our core, a piece of our identity. And so that shows up in our work. And for some of us in our programs, we've been told that that work is not valued or that's not important work. Um, and so that was part of the process of this book as well, is that each one of us brought a piece of our identity and the ways in which we have been able to engage in a research agenda that is authentic to us that is authentic to what we value. Um, and then also to be able to support one another to say that there is space in academic journals or in other academic venues for us to talk about the work that we're doing. And so even in review of what everyone was putting in their chats, right? One may view that as, oh, well, that's me search. You're writing about black males or you're writing about black women or you're writing about underrepresented groups or it's not contextualized within the United States context, right? And so talking about globalization and what that means. And so uh, I also want to state that we see you and we see the work that you're doing um, and we see that as valued work and important work that needs to be shared. Um, so please do not ever let anyone tell you otherwise. Um, and that is also part of writing this, this text. And so that brings us to our next quick write is, what is your writing goal? What are you working on? Um, and maybe right now you don't have something that you're actively working on, but most likely you're processing something in your mind and you're like, oh, I see this piece developing in a particular way. So again, don't worry about complete sentences. Uh, if you're like me, when I'm ty typing in the chat, oftentimes I'll misspell a word. So don't get caught up on that. But truly, we really want you to, to think that through in terms of, okay, what is my goal? What am I, what am I aspiring to, to um, publish or get out there into a, a larger venue? And we'll give you about a minute.
I forgot, I guess we should talk about uh, each one of us just so you can hear what our current writing goals are. Um, so for myself, I'm in more of a academic leadership role. So I haven't been publishing in a traditional space. So actually my goal is not necessarily a writing goal, but more of a reading goal. And that is to continue to edit for a journal. So um, that I'm serving as a reviewer to stay active in my scholarly field. And I'll turn it over to Cindy. What is your writing goal and what are you working on? Sin, are you gonna unmute? To Carlo, unmute. Oh, when I'm, uh, I was <laughs> typing it in the chat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so my writing goal right now is um, to develop manuscripts off of two data sets that I'm, I've just wrapped up. One on, um, I know I'm different from the rest of the group, one on attention in three-year-olds and the other on uh, self-regulatory skills of, um, of threes. So it's a big year for threes over here. <laughs> Exciting. M.M., what is your writing goal? What are you working on? Uh, well, I have a full complement of doctoral students, and so for a long time, I felt somewhat voyeuristic in working with them on um, an article from their dissertation, um, but I, I turned my thought process around. Um, so I, I had a banner year last year. I graduated eight doctoral students, and seven of them have produced manuscripts um, and I agreed to work with them to take them from start to finish um, and to be second author and of course um, you would think that it would end there but but it never ends and so many have come back to me working on second and third pieces um, and I, I've sort of developed into a mentorship role. Um, I'm also working with a new colleague and we are looking at what is going on in terms of literacy leadership in the only decentralized school district in the United States, and that is New Orleans, which is an all charter district. Great. And Leah put hers in the chat, but if you could share. Yeah, um, so I have a series of grant funded projects that I've been working on over the last six years. And if anyone I see, I think it was Odessa mentioned that kind of work is um, is onerous. It's very valuable and exciting, but just making the grants go takes so much time. And so I find myself now sitting on a literal mine of data and reports that need to be um Did she freeze? She did. We'll See, wait. That way. That's all right. Well, while we're waiting for her to come back, just a few things that um, people are working on in the chat. Um, completing your dissertation, which is huge. Um, a book, book reviews, manuscripts, essays for fun. So even seeing it, the writing process is self-care. Um, an empirical paper. Um, something for a presentation. So, uh, and I'm excited for that uh, chat in terms of we're going to talk about taking something from a presentation and turning it into a publication. Uh, so all of us are working on very different things to get out. So with that, we'll keep it going. And I'm going to turn it over to Cindy to talk about writing routines. Um. So writing routines are very, very important. And so one of the, the most interesting things um, that I think for me came out of writing this book is I think by default, we all think that everybody kind of approaches things in the way that we do. So what I have learned is that Margaret, Mary, and I are very much alike in that we get up before the, the chickens and we write very early in the morning. And then we, I guess, tag team with Ty and Leah who um, who work best late into the night and probably hand things off to, to the two of us. But it's very important to know yourself when you are beginning to write. Um, early on in my career, I was adjacent to a colleague who was also new and she would um, set her timer um, and she would um, block off two hours for this project, two hours for that project. And I thought, how in the world can she do that? 
Um, I'm a little bit ADHD, but I just go with it and I work on something that I'm really interested and exciting about until I get all of that out. And then I kind of sit back and I'm like, what do I feel like doing now? And so then I, uh, but I know based on my previous um, work pattern that I am going to get to it. I am a master list maker. Um, I know when things are due and I work um, best early in the morning when I'm fresh. I refuse to check my email early in the morning because I need all of my cognitive ability fresh. Email can wait till later in the day when I have less resources available to me. Um, but it's really important to, to figure out what that time, uh, management or best time to write is for yourself and not try to prescriptively use a model that somebody else uses that may or may not work for you. You can, you know, my, my way might look, uh, very random to other people, but I understand it. I am highly productive and I get to everything that I have, um, on my schedule. So you will be using um, your knowledge of yourself to create um, a goal for yourself and use in our book, we have lots of time management worksheets that help people to get organized in um, setting up their writing routine. And part of that includes the sacred spaces. So where do you write best? Do you have a space that is comfortable for yourself? Um, I have, um, I very much believe in aesthetics. So I have created spaces. I have an office here in our laboratory preschool. Um, and I have an office at home that um, is is tucked away from everyone else. And I, um, I can write very well in those spaces. I'm not the kind of person who can take my laptop and go to a coffee shop and work. I'm too distracted by all the noise I need quiet and focus and I need to feel comfortable in this space so I can settle in and it's different for everybody and you just have to kind of think about um, what spaces feel good to you in addition to what times of day and develop your routine around that and um, I apologize Ty can you go back to the last slide I know I had one more point on there that I wanted to address okay variations in situation and time I think I hit that one pretty good so Okay. And I, I think it's important um, that you know yourself. Um, and I think that if you also are cognizant of your non-negotiables, if you are caring for a parent, or if you are caring for children under the age of 18, some of those issues are non-negotiable. And so what I've been able to also do um, to keep my productivity at a certain level um, is I take care of myself. And so I use Saturdays as sort of a review day to get ready for the next week. And I don't work on Sundays. Um, I devote that time up to, to my religious beliefs and to my family. Um, and it took me a long time to get there and I would feel guilty about it, but I don't anymore. And when we talk about sacred spaces, sometimes I get distracted at home. I think that I have to do laundry or clean something up before I work. And that's just my... Um, I think female brain telling me, do this, do this, do this. Um, so sometimes I can go to a coffee shop. If I take one thing with me and I just work on that, <laughs> it is a struggle. Um, and I also have a, a little office carved out, but I'll tell you my sacred space is usually the dining room table. And I put everything there on the dining room table and then maybe tell my family, you're gonna eat on TV trays tonight because I'm working. Um, so it's very individual. Do not think that what somebody else does is what you should be doing. You have to figure out your peak productivity times. Yeah, so I just added two uh, questions in the chat, just kind of off the cuff, just because I think it's good for you just to name out loud for yourself what those things are. Um, and so normally, um, and Cindy shared that uh, Margaret Mary and her work really early in the morning and Lee and I work really late at night. And part of that is that um, one of my non-negotiables is that my family and I, we sit down and eat dinner together every night, um, except for Saturdays. <laughs> um, but 
um, that is a really important time for me. So um, being in the roles that I've been in for the past few years, I don't normally get home until 536. Um, oftentimes my day is full of meetings and I don't get those blocks of writing time during the day. Um, I do have three children. Um, ranging from 18 to a toddler to three years old. So my house is very active. Um, I like being present at soccer games and things of that nature. And so um, once my family goes down, that's my time to work. Um, and that works for me. Uh, I'm a night owl. Um, my family calls me a night crawler, um, but that's I can actually work during that time. My I don't have any distractions at that time. Um, and so while I could stay at work later and maybe put in writing time during in the office, I don't do that because I do want to be home to have dinner with my family. Um, so that is one of my non-negotiables. Also, as it relates to sacred space, um, people know that I, when I can write on campus, I do. And I find spaces that no one else is in. So there's a space in the library that I have that the only person that knows where I am sometimes is the library, the head librarian. And that is because if someone comes looking for me uh, during the day, that there's someone that can find me. Um, and because I like to turn my phone off and um, depending on the role that you're in, if you have multiple roles at your institution or if you're working full time, sometimes it's really hard to, to turn your phone off or to really disconnect from your device, from that device in particular. And so just being able to name that and sometimes just having that other person that you know, if you have those other responsibilities, they they may know where you are or know that that is a sacred time and can advocate for you when people like to pull on your time, because sometimes it's easy for many of us to say yes. Yeah. And, and not everybody, um, when we talk about sacred spaces, not everybody um, thinks of it the same way. Um, but if you have a place where you store your materials, I also have a very large leather bag and I have pockets on the side and I have everything I need in there. I have markers, I have tape, I have everything so that if I'm traveling, I can pull that stuff out and work. I have favorite pins that I use. And sometimes I think that, um, you know, I can't, I can't scribble things out unless I have my favorite pen. So it is individual. It is individual. It's what you operate under when you are at your peak productivity times. So we are gonna transition a little bit to revisiting that scholarly agenda and a little bit about um, each one of us is gonna talk about our current scholarly agenda. But what I do want everyone to know is that our agendas have evolved over time. Um, and so this is the scholarly agenda that was presented in the text. Um, and that's why we're presenting that. So you'll hear each of us add different pieces that may not be there because post COVID, we've shifted some of our um, scholarly foci, um, potentially because of roles or um, what was in the hopper before is no longer uh, relevant. And so having to make those shifts. So I'll turn it back over to Margaret Mary to kick us off. And, and I appreciate you saying that, Ty, because um, I felt as a young academic, my first um, position, I like to call it my starter position, but I didn't think of it that way when I, I began it, um, was at the University of Southern Mississippi in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And um, they were fortunate enough to be part of um, a network with the University of Michigan on service learning. And so I've always been interested in how literacy operates in urban spaces. Um, and part of that, as Ty mentioned, comes from my identity. Um, neither of my parents were born in the United States. And so, you know, for me, being part of an urban environment meant lots of different languages, lots of different folk, lots of different ways of knowing and seeing. And so I'm interested in how that all comes together, again, um, for PK-12 systems, uh, literacy and urban environments, but I'm also very, very concerned about access issues, particularly in urban environments, although I can also say that I've seen a lot of those issues emulated in rural spaces. Um, so I'm particularly concerned about children having access to literature, especially right now in this highly political environment, um, having access to writing and the arts and the arts. 
Um, and service learning, I've, I've come to view as a pedagogical pathway to prepare pre-service teachers to teach literacy in those urban environments. So it's all about literacy, three strands, but in those urban environments. Thank you. And then, um, let's see, was Leah able to get back on? Yes. Hi. I can hear you. Thank okay, you. Perfect. So Leah, if you Hi, could everyone. talk us through your scholarly agenda. Uh, Leah did lose internet, but she's with us via phone, so. I'm sorry, everyone. As as uh, I'm sure you all know, life continues to happen, and um, we're having some bad weather here, but uh, my apologies. Um, for me, what is interesting is what is on the screen right now is very much the origins of my scholarly agenda, so particularly um, training literacy leaders to work for social justice, um, as well as investigating the practices and skills um, and ways of knowing literacy for adolescents and adults in and out of school settings. Um, increasingly, my work is, is shifting. I'm, as I mentioned, hopefully before I cut off, I'm doing a lot of grant work uh, with the state of Maryland around working with adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities to train first responders on working with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So particularly privileging, not my voice, but their voice inside of the space, uh, their lived experiences, and in turn, how they best uh, perceive working with people with, um, how they best perceive first responders can work with them. And so while those skills and practices of adults uh, and adolescents uh, with and without disabilities and their literacy skills is still a huge part of my research agenda. Um, my research agenda is continuing to shift um, as I continue to learn more. And so that's something that um, I think is a, an outgrowth of my original scholarly agenda, but certainly it continues to morph over time. And as I continue to be a lifelong learner myself. Thank you. And Cindy. So um, my um, scholarly agenda, um, as I said previously, interventions for young children and recommended practices for teachers all within early childhood education. And, and within all of my work, I've made a very concerted effort to include both undergraduate and graduate students in my research projects as data collectors, and co-authors. Um, just about, if you ever looked at my CV, just about anything that I have published on my CV is with a student. Um, and many of the people that I work with now who've gone on to earn PhDs are now colleagues of mine, just in the way that Leah is a colleague with uh, Margaret Mary. Um, and, um, you know, really built that into, into my practice. Um, I am, uh, you know, what some of us have shared earlier, I am also first generation college and I am a practitioner at heart. I worked for 10 years. I went back to school for um, the PhD in my, um, in my thirties. And um, I always have that at the forefront of my mind. And so in one of the chapters in the book, I believe it's chapter three, I talk about that pipeline from, um, you know, research into practice and that translation of research. And so I try to have companion practitioner pieces for every um, research um, article that I publish, because I really want this work in the hands of the people who will use it. And so I really have made an effort to create that pipeline. And you know, as, as things have moved along in my professional career, I now have an Early Childhood Education Institute, and I do have a number of, of doctoral students that are on graduate assistantships. And so one of the main things that I get them to do is to take the work of the other birth to three researchers that are in our, um, our institute and look at how they can work with that original researcher to translate that research into practice by delivering it at 
practitioner conferences and also doing um, practitioner publication pieces so that we are ensuring that the research gets in the hands of the people that will use it. And one of the things that Cindy does that's just masterful and I've learned um, is if she's doing a research article and then she wants a practitioner article, she perhaps is using um, the same literature review and her ability to paraphrase what she's written somewhere else so that she's not constantly um, looking for new material. Although I will say that she doesn't let her students do anything that's over five years old. So that's a, that's a, that's a stretch for me because I have seminal pieces, but she's learned to do that so that she has this lit review and now she's going to take it from a research audience to a practitioner audience and how she revises that is absolutely amazing. Um, so I didn't want to take away and I think, uh, Ty, aren't you next? <laughs> I am next. Um, and so, um, so my research agenda, and I will say that my faculty career was at a small liberal arts institution. So I did not have a, a grant writer or a grants office. Um, I didn't have access to doctoral students or even master's level students. So um, really relying on my network and my colleagues. So Margaret Mary, Cindy, Leah, um, Billy Sankofa Waters at the University of Washington, Tacoma, right? So these were the people that I could do research with. Um, they had access to resources that I did not have access to being at a small liberal arts institution. And so I do want to name that um, because depending on where you are in your own trajectory, if you want to be at an R1 institution or if you are at an R1 institution, um, oftentimes the publishing the productivity expectations look different than if you're at a small teaching uh, focused private institution. And so that if when I talk about my experience, I think it's important to note that that difference. Um, and so um, having a very high teaching load, particularly of undergraduate students and finding time to stay active as a scholar. Um, and so my area is literacy broadly. Um, so in terms of my teaching, I had to teach so many different courses in literacy for the undergraduate program. But more specifically, I was able to really distill and draw down who I was as a literacy scholar because of the scholars that I work with that are on the screen with us today. Um, and so particularly within literacy and teacher education, so the preparation of elementary teachers for reading practices, particularly reading and writing. Um, and then a thread that ran throughout that was academic service learning. So how did I prepare teachers by giving them a service learning experience as part of the curriculum um, and teaching them how to use service learning in their classroom? Um, and that also went along with not just the nuts and bolts of literacy teaching and learning, but also literacy leadership, because many of those teachers would then become either a literacy coach or they would become a principal. Uh, Margaret and Mary and I did a lot of work around literacy leadership with a local principal in a school district um, that, that I worked closely with. And so really translating um, a lot of the work that I do so that it was also applicable in the classroom. So uh, some of my scholarship is in the scholarship of teaching and learning because I spent so much time in the classroom and being able to translate that um, to a, a similar to Cindy, right? A very practitioner audience. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things before we transition is also noting that each of us have a visual representation of our scholarly agenda. And so I would encourage you um, and it doesn't have to be with color and um, or graphic design, but really thinking about how would you visualize your scholarly agenda? One, I think it's helpful because it allows you to see all the multiplicities of your leadership agenda um, and the different facets that make it up, whether that's the who, like in Cindy's, you see who she works with that shows up um, or the what. Um, or even the interdisciplinary nature, like Margaret Mary's, which is the intersection of literacy, but also that arts integration. So you can see that for yourself. And I think also for many of you, as you're thinking about maybe a job talk, that also is a great way to talk about your work if giving a job talk. Yeah. Margaret and it, it, it sounds like, um, like 
like we have this mastered, but I don't want anybody to think that because I had to really work at being an interdisciplinary literacy scholar um, at both institutions that I've worked at. Um, when I was at Southern Miss, um, I was a faculty service learning fellow and I worked under a chair who didn't know anything about service learning. And she struggled mightily. She said, I don't get it. And I don't think it's any a big deal. And I think it's a trend. So I had to work at that. When I came to LSU, I also had to work at that um, because I was amongst colleagues who thought everybody should have this niche and you never deviated. And I'm not like that. So I had to really work at sort of um, schooling my colleagues of the importance of being an interdisciplinary scholar. And I think all of us have struggled with that a little bit um, to, to different degrees. And to, to resist that uber traditional notion that you find this niche and that's what you do for the rest of your life. I, none of you us know, did that, none of us did that. I do also want to piggyback on what um, Ty and Margaret Mary said about the importance of having this graphic organizer. You know, I've now been at um, LSU Baton Rouge for 19 years. So in that amount of time, you see you see people come and go um, over time. Those are who are successful and those who are not so successful. And so one of the things that I have observed um, is that sometimes what messes people up when they are in the mode of publish or perish is that they will go after every single thing, whether it aligns with their purpose, their stated purpose or not. And so creating this graphic representation is you know, absolutely wonderful at explaining yourself to other people, but it is also a good litmus test for yourself. Like, do I need to you know, go after this literacy grant. I'm not a literacy scholar. My area is solidly social and emotional development with very young children. So I can do it. It's not like I don't have a background in that, but it's going to take me off of my stated agenda. It will take me a whole lot longer to do something um, than it would take uh, Margaret, Mary, or Ty in working on something with literacy. And so it's really not something that I need to focus on. I need to look for things that are very targetedly within my area. So that way my research agenda continues to grow and build on itself. I'm contributing to the knowledge base in that area. And then I'm maximizing my time. If I go off in all these different detours, I become what I call an academic ambulance chaser. And I divide my attention and I do not maximize my time in the best way possible. So I was gonna add uh, to the chat, just as a question is that, so for many of you, you're, you probably have been, or um, you are currently uh, pondering that friend or that colleague that says, hey, do you wanna work on this project with me? Hey, do you want to write this grant with me? Hey, do you want to write this article with me? Hey, do you want to present with me at this conference? And so while it is flattering sometimes and you're like, yes, again, going back to what Cindy's saying, if it doesn't align to your research agenda, it's okay to say no. And no is a complete sentence. So I'll let that sit just for a little bit. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Cindy to talk a little bit about using low, utilizing low hanging fruit. Okay, so if you're going to be um, successful in having um, a very robust um, scholarly agenda and publication um, uh, productivity, um, there are several things that you can do that, um, you know, collectively we use the term low hanging fruit. So for me, I always want the formula to everything. I'm very, very behavioral at my core. You know, my original certification area is early intervention. So I was socialized in all of, um, you know, that, uh, that languaging. And so um, I wanted to know how to do certain, certain things. I know how to write a research article. And the reason I do is because they have headings that are provided for me. And so I know it's kind of like question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. I had no idea how to write a, a practitioner article because those structures do not exist. So but what I do know how to do 
is create a presentation. And so some of the process that I use myself that I wish, you know, we all jokingly said, this is the book that we wish we had when we were students. Um, so what I do know how to do is put together a training presentation. And so something that I do with my students is I help, help them to develop an idea, put together a conference proposal, which is easy because guess what? Conference proposals have a rubric. So they tell you exactly what they want. Question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. I can do that. I can get my students to do that. Then they put together their thoughts um, into this presentation. And then as they deliver the presentation or practice first, they understand uh, or they begin to develop what they are going to say that kind of flushes out the article for them. Conference presentations are also a really good way. Like if you have a research something that you're presenting, but you maybe haven't quite developed your, um, your discussion section, you present at a conference and people ask you all of these questions and you're like, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Uh, future research, um, you know, ideas for future research, um, some, some limitations you maybe hadn't thought of yet. So, um, you know, you can maximize your time presenting at conferences by taking it a step further and tr transitioning this into a publication. Um, you also want to make sure um, that um, the segue between lunch and learns and conference presentations, I use lunch and learns as kind of like a mini conference presentation, kind of testing the waters. And so you, you create this pipeline for yourself of little things that build and build and build and build until you have you know, a presentation, a publication, a grant proposal. So you're not ever starting from a blank page. Um, it's very important to keep an updated list of publication outlets. So you're very adept at what practitioner journals are in your area, research journals, and then the teaching and learning journals. And you know what those author guidelines are. Um, it's very, very helpful to get on their review boards so that you have an opportunity to, um, to review for them and you know exactly what they're looking for. What I do myself and what I tell my students is, of course, always read the author guidelines, but then you want to critically analyze three articles from a very recent edition of that publication. And what you're looking for is the way that the current editor interprets those author guidelines. So, you know, I'll go through an article and I'll be like, okay, five to seven paragraphs for the introduction, this many major headings, approximately this many um, research citations, um, so I kind of get a, an idea of the mechanics, because like I said, I'm always looking for the instruction, question, answer, question, answer. So then I get more of a feel of what the author guidelines are, are asking me for. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, and so I'll turn it over to Leah now, who's going to talk a little bit about getting mileage out of our work. Thanks, guys. So um, I am a, an associate professor at Loyola, and I am also currently the chair of the board of rank and tenure. And I know not everyone on this call is on the tenure track or is interested in being even in the tenure track. Um, but regardless, we all have a set of guidelines for our annual review, for our evaluation that kind of dictate our roles at our respective institutions whether that's as a student or as a faculty member or an administrator. And so I always like to think about my publishing and productivity in terms of working smarter and harder, or smarter versus harder, smart and hard. Um, and what does that mean? It starts with really understanding what counts for you in terms of your annual review. So for me, I try to integrate the three components of my scholarly role, which is teaching, research, and service everywhere possible. Um, so for example, I mentioned at the onset, I'm a mixed methodologist and I sometimes teach uh, doctoral courses in evaluation, program evaluation. Um, I also see myself as a community engaged scholar. And so what that means for me, getting more mileage out of my work, might mean partnering with a community organization who needs an evaluation done uh, for their program, for their uh, maybe a grant that they're working on. 
and they maybe don't have the money for that. Um, so in turn, I use that evaluation in my courses. My students have the opportunity to authentically learn from it um, and also learn how to create research based on that evaluation. So I am hitting all three components of my expectations, um, scholarship, research, and then community service by thinking about how I can um, work smarter and harder while also meeting the requirements of publishing and productivity. Um, along with that, as um, Cindy's mentioned, I think a couple times, thinking about different ways or different outlets to communicate that information. So maybe it's public scholarship, maybe it's in the form of um, a newspaper article or a blog, um, perhaps it's a practitioner article and then a more scholarly article. Uh, for example, um, the course that I'm talking about using um, evaluation and community engaged learning, I also wrote an article about using community engaged learning with graduate students as a teaching method. So thinking through at the end of the day, what goes on your odometer uh, and what can count in multiple places uh, authentically and ethically is really uh, something that for me has worked well and kept me very true to the work that I also find meaningful um, and find meaningful for my students. Thank you, Leo. Well, we do recognize that we have about four minutes left, so I'm going to actually, unfortunately, skip uh, a few slides. Um, but as I begin to wrap us up, one, just that second question, if you could just put it in the chat, um, just as you reflect on our past 55 minutes together, what is one takeaway um, from this session that you may implement or that you're thinking about implementing? And so I'm going to begin to wrap us up, um, and we will also be mindful monitoring the chat. But while we do that, um, part of our wrap up is just a quick whip around from each one of us in terms of how do we keep things going? What, what is one of our key strategies for success? Um, and, and I'll turn it over to Leah to kick us off. Absolutely. One way that I uh, keep myself going is uh, as a community engaged scholar, staying very involved with community organizations. So I'm always looking, uh, given my research agenda, to answer the questions of the community, not necessarily uh, questions that I have. And so um, for me, one of my strategies for success in places that I get energy is being engaged with my local community. Thank you. Margaret Mary. I get energized when I treat myself well. And at the ripe old age of 66, it took me a long time to learn that. And so if I'm not taking care of my heart, my mind, my body, and my soul, I'm not very good. So I am constantly working on how I can do things uh, for myself that I feel good about in terms of my scholarship, but also I'm not like burning the candle at both ends over and over again. Routine works for me. Right. Cindy. Um, I work with a lot of different people and um, I try to make sure that however many projects that I'm working on that I have an equal number of collaborators because that way I feel like it it keeps the synergy going. If I'm working on something after I finish working on it, I can pass it to a collaborator and then I can move on to the next thing that I'm working on with a different collaborator. So that way I kind of keep everything moving and um, am able to have um, conversations with different people who are just as excited about whatever it is we're working on as I am. And that makes it fun for me in a nerd sort of way. Thank you. Uh, for myself, it's maintaining strong relationships with those that I have um, worked with in the past and currently working with. Uh, being in my current role. I don't know if I want to be a provost forever. Uh, I love being a scholar. I love being a good teacher. And so at some point, I may want to go back into those spaces. And so being able to maintain those relationships so that I can stay actively engaged um, in, in my area of expertise. So with that, if you want a deeper dive, so you'll notice that we skipped through some of the slides that highlighted the chapters. Every piece of content that we focused on today is out of a chapter of the book. Um, and so 
invite us to campus, invite us to um, your professional organization. Uh, we are very accessible. We are here to help. Like that is our goal is that we want to reach back and pull forward. Um, and so whether that is new faculty orientation, faculty development, uh, tenure and promotion support, institutional research and effectiveness, um, as more and more institutions, they want to know about the data. How are your students doing? What, what are your DFW rates? All those great things. Um, faculty writing groups. Um, whether you're at different institutions or even at the same institution, but knowing that um, we are here to, to support you as uh, scholars, we're here to support you as a faculty member, we're here to support you as an academic leader, whatever role that you have. And so very grateful for your time today. We did say we were going to leave time for questions and unfortunately we did it. So hopefully you found the chat um, very motivating and inspiring. Thank you for your engagement and I'll turn it back over to Petra. Thank you so very much. Um, I, I know we all want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, but I would implore you that if you do have questions, um, go ahead and still post them in the chat, or you could see uh, email addresses on the screen. Um, there will be a copy of the recording available as well. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, I agree the words of wisdom were, in fact, priceless. All those tips um, and gems, I love the amb academic ambulance chaser, made me start to think about, okay, what are you doing? Are you chasing an ambulance here um, with some of the projects that you're getting involved in? But this is, has been really, really great. And thank you so very much for all your insights and experiences. Um, it was really um, accessible to all of us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So as we wrap up, I want to just continue to encourage those of you who are uh, participating in the boot camp to keep working with your groups. Um, and again, we're here if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, this service that AABHE does for us um, every summer has really been useful and we hope that you know, you'll continue to uh, build your scholarship and keep getting um, your research out there um, to those who matter, right? So thank you, everybody. Uh, please pay attention to what Dr. Howard Baptiste has put in the chat. Please check your email and complete the survey that Josh Shank will share so we can check in on everybody and how you all are progressing. A copy of the chat. Will that be automatic with the? It, it may go to the the organizer so yes. um yeah so that shouldn't be a problem at all yeah um yeah. for everyone here that's a great data source um interested in academic writing as i am it's a way for me to to pull in other voices it was interesting to me that ac academic ambulance chaser and sacred space emerged with this group as being important that's cool All right. People are still hanging around. If there's anything you'd like to say or ask, please feel free to do that. Well, thank you for this. This has been helpful, even for an old timer like me. Age is right. just a number. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. I like that commercial too. It just says age is just a number, and, I'm, and mine's what is it? Mine is uh, unlisted. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. You know, Sabrina asked about being organized. Um, I, I think that's like a lifelong journey. Um, but one of the things that that works well for me is I'm also a list maker. And I've been known to create a list and at the top put three things I've already done. Um, but I also, I also um, work off of my um, Outlook calendar. I try to put everything on my calendar and that's become more important for me because I have a boss who looks on my calendar and if she thinks I'm not busy, um, she'll ask me to do something. And so I've begun to block my calendar. And so, for example, if I'm gonna teach a 4.30 class, at one o'clock, I say, I'm prepping for that class. 
and it helps me. I know I have to prep for the class. It helps me actually be organized for that class. So putting those major events on your calendar will help you. Logging your time uh, for three weeks on when you write and your non-negotiables will help you become more organized. I, I take that, I take that one step further. That um, uh, I'm even I'm supposed I'm supposed to be retired, but I'm still working. Um, and I have uh, I have another boss, and so I make make sure that my wife sees my calendar and knows what I'm doing. <laughs> we, thank you. Sometimes she gets tired of seeing me. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have a, we have a house calendar in our house, and uh, about a year ago, um, my forty year old daughter moved in with her three month old. So life is really different. We have a house calendar, and so we put the stuff that we're doing as a family on that house calendar, and then I have my professional calendar. So that's important. Happy wife, yeah, yeah. happy life. <laughs> <laughs> I put I put my initial row. I put row in, in so it and a dash, and then. She knows it's just my for information for purposes. So, yeah. And Sabrina, that dissertation happens chapter by chapter. Organize yourself around those chapters. If you start to think of, I have a dissertation, or even I have chapter one to do, it becomes overwhelming. Break it down into little pieces. What's your topic? What's your purpose? What's your audience? What are your questions? Break it down into smaller chunks. It's more manageable. And Ty, I think I cut you off. Well, no, I was going to say, Margaret Mary, if you could share a little bit, because I've always found that helpful, that you always have something with you that you're working on. Well, well, okay. So I started that as a, um, a high school English teacher and then an elementary Title I teacher. Um, I would carry things with me because for years and years and years as a teacher, I would pack a bag and take it home. And after a while, didn't even get out of the car. What was I doing? So I learned to sort of keep things at work that are work-related, even though I do lots of work at home. And so um, I take something with me all the time. If I go into a faculty meeting at LSU, I don't need to speak because chances are somebody else is going to say what I think I need to say. And so to keep my mouth shut um, and to keep myself productive, I take something with me. Like sometimes it's I need to check references on an article. I take it with me. And so it's interesting because sometimes people think I'm quiet, which I'm not. Um, and But people will say to me, you're always working on something. I try to maximize every single bit of time. I'm a commuter, live in New Orleans, work in Baton Rouge. And sometimes I get stuck on Interstate 10 for hours. I love it. I used to like sort of, you know, momentarily freak out. Now it's like, oh, you know what? I can pull this out of my bag and I can get something done. Um, so I always have something with me to work on. Uh, and I have a doc student uh, who recently graduated and she carpooled her kids to school. And so she said, do you know how much you can get done in 20 minutes? And I said, yes. So you don't need these great big chunks of time. You just need to have a focus and a goal. Mm -hmm. Like today I'm going to do this and you do it. You take that with you all day long. Get a big purse, get a big purse or a backpack. Carry it with you. Hopefully, Sabrina, that's also helpful. Um, I know that helped me um, manage when like I didn't have content that I was writing, but I felt like I should have been doing something. And so, but at the same time, I didn't want to just sit at my computer and check references or check my APA citations. So I'll be honest, I'm probably one of the worst church goers that exists. And so I would actually, <laughs> because of Margaret Mary, I would actually sometimes take it to church and like I could pull it out and I would look um, and yeah, I mean, but I had, I mean, I used all my time. And so that way I could, I had young children at home when I was writing dissertation. So I could focus on content when I was like actually writing at home and then do kind of those spot checks or edit a, a few pages in other places. And, and with that comes, yeah, that comes a, there, a lot of discipline comes with that, a lot of discipline. Um, so, Joy, I am still using some of the literature that I reviewed for my dissertation, and I graduated in 1999. So, wow. what, it, what it means, yeah, a long time ago, what it means is, um, like, I have seminal pieces that I constantly still use, and so 
I will get out, you know, the most recent article that I wrote where I maybe can, uh, and one of the things that I've talked a lot about is that um, the teaching force is predominantly white middle income females. And, and I have nothing against white middle income females. However, there's a disconnect between what we see happening in public education, larger numbers of children of color, and there is a dissonance between that cultural experience, sometimes it is economic experience between the teaching force and the teachers. I still go back to my original lit review, but of course I update it. And so if I'm talking about, um, you know, how multifaceted uh, or complex it is between teaching and learning, um, I will sit there and I will search on my thesaurus. What's another word for multifaceted? What's another word? for complex. So my idea stays the same, but I'm using different phrasing and wording. And for me, it's almost like a game. Like, how can I say this, but say it differently? It's the same process that I use when I read an article and I say to myself, I want to review this article and include it in a publication. So I always talk about the authors, when it was published, the setting, the participants, the research design that was being used in the findings. And so if I wanna take what somebody has said in an article, I have to paraphrase it unless I wanna quote them directly. And so I've taught myself to do that. How can I take some wording and rephrase it? I also gain extra income by reviewing for the Department of Health and Human Services and the US Department of Education. And so I've also learned how to take what an applicant has said this is what my project is, and to rephrase it as a strength or a weakness. And so for me, it all makes sense because lots of times when I'm reviewing work, it's like, this thing got published, but I don't think it's strong. And so I will, I will use it in a lit review, but I will point out that the weaknesses of this article or this research study is. And so I, I kind of think of that way, sort of what's a strength, what's a weakness, but just being able to rephrase. Take a paragraph from an article, take a paragraph, Joy, from an article and rewrite it, rewrite it in your own words. And that that is exactly what I'm talking about. Just that art of being able to rephrase. Thank you, it is very helpful. <laughs> yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Okay. Can I come in about reusing literature really quickly? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. So I use Zotero, um, which is, you know, a citation reference manager. There's a lot of different ones out there. Um, but more than the actual specific software, when I read an article, I have a template of an article review um, that I keep. And it has a lot of the same things Margaret Mary just spoke about. And I... Um, in my citation manager, we'll upload the original article, upload my review of that article, and I'll code it using certain terminology. Uh, for example, maybe it's about a certain type of participant or an age range or a region. Um, and then I'm able to search across all of my literature review the next time I'm writing an article around those different topics. So for example, if I am writing a new research article um, on uh, 18 year olds in the South, um, I can search my previous literature that I've already reviewed for other articles that are about that age range in that region of the country. And my summary is already there. So I don't lose time having to reread an article that I've already written. Um, so I'm able to kind of track and call my own words. Um, and of course, as Margaret Mary mentioned, you still have to reword and paraphrase, but it allows me um, to manage my time efficiently uh, by being able to pull across all of my different playlists, uh, so to speak, of literature that um, I've already reviewed. And, and I also have a template, just the things that I mentioned. Um, and so I call them one pagers. So I have different terminology than Leah Catherine. But when I review an article, I create a one pager. And when I say one page, one side, one page on my screen, single spaced, um, of what that article was about, who wrote it, 
And I use different words. I have a list of, of power words. We included them in the book, um, but I mean, nothing big, you know, instead of so-and-so wrote, so-and-so said, that gets so boring. Uh, and so, you know, I challenged myself to use different words. They posited, they postulated, they illustrated, they illuminated, they expanded upon. And so I just keep going back and forth. And it, it's like a word game to me. I mean, Cindy DiCarlo talked about being a nerd and I'm like, oh no, girl, I'm the nerd. I'm the queen nerd <laughs> in the room. Uh, but I, I, I like to write. I wasn't always that way. I began to like to write. And I also know enough about myself that I'm much better at responding to writing than generating it myself. So when I work with people, I'll just tell them that, like, you know, can you get started? And then can I be the second or third person? And Petra, we did that with our, our um, uh, encyclopedia entry. You know, it's like, I'm much better at responding. And so once you just sort of learn what your skill sets are, you learn all the skills when it comes to writing. You need to generate ideas. I do that with an outline. Somebody writes something, then I go in and I review it. And so you, you teach yourself how to do that. Okay, well, I think that's it for us for today. I really want to say, you know, thank you again to each of you for staying on this long and continuing this conversation. This has been really, really helpful and insightful. Um, we'll get the recordings out to you all. Okay, all right. thank you. Thank you for the invite. We appreciate it as well. Okay, thanks so much. Take care, right. everybody. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. Bye.